morning. Welcome to the program committee sponsored session titled Revolt Against a Carceral World Part One. We are at the 2021 American Studies Association annual meeting. My name is Dylan Rodriguez, he, him pronouns. I'm proud and humbled to be the convener and chair of this discussion. Uh, I'm speaking to you all from occupied Kauia and Tongva land in Southern California, a city called Corona, where I live. And uh, my place of work, University of California Riverside, is just down the street from where the Riverside Police Department stole the life of Taisha Miller in 1998, shortly before I started working there. Um, so just to let you all know something about how we're going to proceed, I'm going to open up with a round of two, I think, capacious questions. And then I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves in whatever way they wish. And then from there, uh, we'll open it up to a broader discussion with folks who are in attendance here. Looking forward to this a lot. I'm glad you all are here. So let's take advantage of this moment with these folks who are together in this conversation with each other. So um, the first question I, I wanted to open up with is uh, to ask our folks who are here, Jennifer Marley, Rachel Herzing, Dean Spade, Sandy Grande, David Hernandez, Eddie Conway, um, Dorothy Roberts. Uh, Glenn Coltard is not gonna join us because uh, he's sick, he's gonna be okay. He does not have breakthrough COVID. Um, he wanted to reassure everybody he's just not feeling well. Um, I want to give a special shout out to uh, my, my former student and now comrade, always been my comrade, Cameron Granadino, who facilitated some of the, the tech stuff for us, for our participants. Um, so this is the folks that we have gathered here, you all. And um, I want you all to just be taking notes and thinking about how you want to take advantage of their presence here. So um, the opening question that I have for our panelists is how would you identify and describe the creative possibilities of revolt against forms of capture, policing, and criminalization in this historical period. And take that any way you wish. And please do introduce yourselves. My pronouns are he, him. Um, this is Dylan Rodriguez. My pronouns are he, him for folks um, who can hear me, who can only hear me right now. Uh, let, me, let me go in order of the way I just read your names, which is somewhat random. Um, if, if I um, can do, actually, you know what? I'll do it backwards. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start with you, Dorothy. Okay, thank, thank you, Dylan, and thanks so much for bringing us together. I'm just thrilled to be among these wonderful abolitionists and who I've learned so much from. And thank you also to all of you who gathered to, to listen and engage with us. Um, I'm Dorothy Roberts. I uh, am a professor at University of Pennsylvania, and uh, I am zooming in from West Philadelphia, uh, the land of the Lenape people and the site of the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Police Department's bombing of the MOVE uh, families in 1985. Uh, and I use she, her pronouns. So uh, for me, you know, there's, there's lots of ways I could answer this, uh, but I'll just highlight one, which is uh, the increasing way we're understanding connections among different systems and institutions that operate by carceral logics that are connected to criminal law enforcement and surveillance and incarceration, but not solely confined to them. Uh, so I'm referring to, for example, Maya Shenoir and Victoria Law's Prison by Any Other Name, where they show how reforms that are supposed to reduce incarceration and all the suffering from incarceration and justice from it can be equally oppressive as prisons are. And I have been working on abolishing the so-called uh, child welfare system, uh, what I and others are calling family regulation or policing systems that show how even public service systems in the United States that are supposed to be there just to benevolently serve people, protect children, are actually forms of terror against whole communities. And so I think by understanding how carceral logics and entanglements with police and other parts of the criminal legal system, criminal punishment system 
all work together, it, it creates these possibilities for learning from each other, uh, acting collectively, and more effectively revolting against all of them. Uh, so that, that's one thing I would point to as a creative possibility. I think this, this opens up more creative, collective work when we understand how carceral logics bring together these systems, especially the ones that a lot of people think help and they actually are forms of state terror. Outstanding, thank you, Dorothy. Um, Eddie, from um, I think I think uh, Eddie, you're you're up next. If you don't mind, introduce yourself real quick. Uh oh, there he is. Okay, he just went off camera. Eddie, introduce yourself real quick, and then offer us your thoughts. My my um longtime comrade, Eddie Conway. We lose you, Eddie. All right, Eddie's still there, but let me let me move. Oh, there he is. You back, Eddie? You have to unmute. There we I'm go. Sorry. That's all right. I, uh... Yeah, I I would um I was just looking at it from the hey, Eddie, introduce yourself real quick. Oh, okay. I'm <laughs> Eddie Conway, uh former um uh, member of the Black Panther Party. Uh I was a political prisoner for about 43 years. Uh, I'm a executive producer at the Real News now. Um and um no oh, I guess that's that's the sum of it. Okay, I I look at it from and I and I look at your questions and I I take them from the criminalization point first, the police point second, and then the capture third. Uh, and so early on, uh, we have to recognize that when we say mass incarceration in the prison industrial complex, it's really not true. It's targeted incarceration. It's aimed at uh, people of color in general. 75% of the people in prison are uh, people of color. I mean, across the nation. Uh, obviously, the, um, everybody knows this, but America has the largest prison population in the world, uh, two point some million. And the criminalization starts with the laws uh, even the broken window syndrome that occurs in poor communities and and impoverished communities, black communities, communities of color, uh, a tremendous amount of young people, men, young boys, and young girls now are incarcerated uh, as a result of sitting on the steps or walking across the street. They start off getting juvenile records. Uh, those records transfer to later on to adult records. Uh, so the, the whole thing of criminalization is a, is a point that we need to look at first because that's where it starts at. And obviously you can change the laws. Some states have changed the laws. Some local communities have changed the laws. They have been doing that kind of work. But in addition to that is a process of uh, jury nullification. And that's in the black community and communities of color per se. Uh, you have the ability to set on juries and make decisions about whether or not someone has done harm to your community or whether it was something that you don't need to incarcerate that person for. Uh, so I think that's that's one of the things, and 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 that jury nullification, and I'll talk about that in a, in a second, uh, has been used in uh, other uh, localities, and it's been effective. Um, but the police in itself is an issue that has to be addressed, and I think the only way you can actually address it effectively is, uh, and this is. Uh, program that the Black Panther Party was talking about uh, 55 years ago, community control of the police. Uh, and at this point, people have at, start looking at how to gain control. One, get rid of that police bill of rights. 
that's a bad kind of coverage that needs to be nullified on on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, give people the power that they need in the community to hire, to fire, and to imprison uh, police if they behave in negative ways to the community. Uh, the, and, and that last point, the capture part, which ends up landing you in prison uh, or in jails. Uh, and when you actually unravel all the thing about prisons and jails, you'll find out that it's an economic entity. It makes money, it makes money for various businesses, various agencies, and, and people get rich from the prison labor. Uh, that can only be nullified by organizing massive prison labor unions. Uh, prisoners can demand and should demand uh, minimum wage. And if they can do that, then it's no longer lucrative to continue to lock up so many people. Eddie, can, um, we, pa can we pause right there and I can go through that beat yeah. and we can come back to your thoughts? Yeah. Beautiful. Yes, I'm thank sorry. you. Thank you. Thank you for. No, 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 no. I appreciate you, it. You know, I'm not an academic, so I'm going to no, be wrong. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Proudly. Proudly, right? No, yeah. I, okay. I appreciate it. Appreciate it, Eddie. All right. uh, I got, I got I, just so y'all remind y'all, oh, I got David, then Sandy, then Dean, then Rachel, then Jennifer. So David, why don't you, why don't you hit us and introduce yourself, pronouns, all that kind of stuff. Hi, everybody. I'm David Hernandez. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a faculty member at the at Mount Holyoke College where I teach uh, Latina, Latino, and Latinx studies. Um, I really thank, thank you, Dylan, for inviting me to this panel. I'm already have two pages of notes just from Dorothy and Eddie um, so far. And uh, um, you know, I, I really liked your question. I mean, I, I guess I just can't, when I saw it initially, I just couldn't help but thinking of, of the sort of creativity and inspiration I drew just from the fearlessness that we saw, you know, in the streets over the last few years um, and how that is an inspiration uh, to people. And, you know, I always, it made me think back to an article I always teach from Robin Kelly's Race Rebels, a chapter on, on uh, kind of the pre-Rosa Parks fighting that happened on buses, you know, um, uh, uh, oftentimes at a total loss uh, in terms of being uh, um, arrested and stuff, but, but the inspiration it, it sort of uh, gave to people who, who were capped, who were witnesses to that, and then either joined in um, as participants or, you know, locked it in their memories and, and took it to another day. And so um, that was one of the creative possibilities in, in a similar, in my area, I, I, I focus on immigration enforcement. Uh, in the last few years, um, there was a bunch of immigrant youth who actually put placed themselves in uh, deportation proceedings in order to enter into the carceral space and infiltrate that space and then organize from within inside. Um, and there's actually a, a brand new movie about that uh, called The Infiltrators. Um, that, that's interesting. Um, but uh, you know, this, so there's all you know, there's all kinds of uh, creative possibilities there. People, you know, I. I can't pretend to, to think of these things on my own. I, I, I have to learn by exa the examples that are set before me. So um, yeah, those, that's, what I, that's what, how I'd answer those questions, that question. Yeah, I watched, I watched that film and um, it, was, uh, it was something beyond inspirational. It actually was like a blueprint. Yeah. You know, it was a, and a blueprint both in terms of tactics and in terms of people's fucking courage. Right. You know, like it was, it's, it's just, yeah, it, was, it blew me up. Um, Thank you, Dudley. Uh, Sandy, please. Thank you, Dylan. Thanks to everybody. I appreciate all the words so far. Ayan Chu, Ayan Mi, Wina Starda, Sweetie, Sandy Grande. Um, uh, I identify as the Quechua National, use she, her pronouns. I'm a professor in the uh, University of Connecticut in the Department of Political Science, and I, um, uh, where I do political theory and Native American and Indigenous studies. Um, I'm just going to mention a few, like, inspired by the sort of notion of courage of folks on the ground. I think, um, I mean, as an Indigenous person, Indigenous scholar, when I think of carceral, carcerality and carceral logics, I think primarily how we're all captive by the nation state. 
Um, I think about how the nation state itself is relatively short history and period of time. Um, and I think a lot beyond the nation state. I don't presume um, its continuity or persistence. Um, and that's, that's to me, one of the fundamental prisons, I think, that in incarcerates us. Um, and, then, uh, and then I think about the notion of creative revolt. I think revolt in any its form, creative, not creative, <laughs> revolt is really the only relationship to the systems currently in place. Um, um, but I do think about sort of the, the creativity and as you know, Dylan and others have said that the courage of movements um, mo in my own sort of life, I've done some work with New York uh, Stands with Standing Rock um, in, in the wake of that movement uh, or really in the midst of that movement uh, the syllabus for that is you can still find online. Um, I've done a lot of work with the folks that decolonize this place in New York. And um, their work really is just tremendous, um, both in terms of its creativity. Um, you know, if you look at the work um, done uh, around um, uh, statues and edifices of various kinds, monuments to, to capitalism and colonialism that are all over the city, um, they've they've launched a, a quite a few struggles, and then most recently that work has um, morphed into what is the Strike MoMA movement. I can put the link to that in the chat. Dylan, you've hung out with us a bit on that effort, um, and that's really around, um, in some ways, what incarcerates even creative movements, even what we understand to be the arts. Um, and how these edifices, you know, that we call museums really house our ancestors, how <laughs> they, they captivate so much in, 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 um, in those spaces. Um, and in particularly in New York, uh, the folks that sit on boards are often folks um, who have ties and have earned their wealth uh, through um, the, you know, various aspects of the military industrial complex. Um, in really vile and pernicious ways. So um, I'll, do, I'll just leave that there and look forward to the conversation. No, that's excellent. And I just put in chat how, how my intersections and kind of collaboration with some of those people that organized Strike MoMA has, it has indelibly altered how I understand um, everything, <laughs> but especially how I understand revolt, movement, um, aesthetics, art. And, 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 and I appreciate Sandy, you're putting it out there how, I think you said, you use the word vile and pernicious for these, um, you know, these blue blood philanthropist types that um, basically have commodified the art world based on their colonial and chattel wealth. I mean, it's transgenerational colonial chattel wealth. It's deep and it's, um, it's evil. Um, Dean, you're up. Thanks, thanks for inviting me to this, Dylan. It's such an interesting conversation. Really delight to be with all these people. Um, I'm Dean Spade. I usually live on Duwamish land, Seattle, Washington, um, but I'm not there right now. But, um, and, and I teach at Seattle U and involved in various things there. Um, well, I, um, like David, when I th thought about this question, I immediately just thought about the recent, um, uh, you know, recent kinds of mobilization that we've seen, both in terms of the uprising against um, anti-Black racism and policing, and the kinds of mobilization that have happened around COVID and helping people survive. And I think, I'm just thinking a lot about like um, what makes people get mobilized and also the forces of demobilization that quickly follow. And so I'm just, th I've been just thinking about that tension and like, um, and the ways we've, the ways we saw like quick efforts to right the ship from so many different institutional um, powers, city councils, county councils saying they're going to defund the cops, but then they all backpedal and you don't see that defunding or, you know, all the different institutions that suddenly were making noise about reparations or about changing their curricula or whatever. And then it's like, what really happens, you know, and just thinking about how do we imagine sustained resistance and what is it that does put people back to feeling like things are okay or good enough? Or what is it that keeps people from getting into the dirty details of what actually did or didn't come from? the fear that was struck into the hearts of the institutional players by pretty meaningfully disruptive <laughs> mobilization. Um, so that's like really on my mind a lot. And I think where my, where my attention turns at this time um, 
I think we are in a very terrifying time in which there are no guarantees that we like, I think I just don't have a lot of like naivete left about some idea that I will see like a successful global re revolt against capitalism and white supremacy and colonialism before we run the clock on climate change. And there's no, I, just, I think it's like very sobering to be like, oh, if there's no guarantees about that, then what do we do in the day to day? And I think my attention turns to like two necessities. One is like to do all the most ordinary work. Like how can every single person be involved in like multiple mutual aid projects that are just like changing the diapers and like getting the old people some food and like thinking about how we're going to have a, have any food when the fossil fuel system is breaking down and like just all like how can we like massively intensify the ordinariness of our day-to-day -day work for each other's survival and then on the other hand like boldness like how do we intensify the boldness of every aspect of our work so I'm also thinking about like people who are going head-to-head -head against cops right now with all these different sweeps of homeless encampments in all of our different cities and mostly I would say that work right now is not really working out like I haven't seen people stop police from raiding encampments but instead it becomes this harm reduction work of like how do we save a few people's belongings as the cops come in and raid but what would it be like if we outnumbered the cops in those situations more successfully or what is it like when people successfully do prison breaks or what is it like when people successfully stop ice arrests we've seen that to some degree has happened here and there so like I guess I'm just always thinking like how do we we need a lot more people mobilized in order to both do this ordinary work very deeply and thoroughly to create new social relations that are survivable, even as things get less survivable. And we need a lot more people so that we can up the boldness. And we've, so we saw those moments of boldness, like, yes, let's burn down the police station and burn the cop cars, but we need that to be like, not quite so episodic, you know, and then die, dying down um, in order to sustain the changes we're seeing. So yeah, so I think right now I'm, I'm studying a lot of the counter moves that our opposition yeah. is doing in the wake of that mobilization. And I'm trying to be sober about what's actually happening and the ways in which those counter moves are pretty successful. That's right. And notice where um, where people are are trying to build that boldness and that ordinariness. That's right. No, this is the, this is the period of, of counterinsurgency. We're, we're fully in it. Um, and I, want, I also wanna tell, I don't know if I told you this, Dean, but, but Dean and, um, Dean and I had this great conversation. I'll put a link to it in the chat as part of the ASA's Freedom Courses series about a year and a half ago now, talking about mutual aid and abolition. And there's something Dean said during that discussion that just echoed here that I want to bring up, which is um, the idea of proliferation. And I think that's the word you might have used, Dean, but just thinking about it, that, that, that when we think about sustaining movements, we too often fall back into a kind of an entrepreneurial capitalist mentality of trying to center everything, create one giant thing. And I remember Dean intervening on that and saying, no, that may not be the best model. It probably isn't the best model. Maybe the point is to proliferate so that there's no center. Um, it's like guerrilla war. I mean, this is what we're talking about, right? I mean, that's that. Anyway, um, thank you, Dean. Thank you, Dean. Um, I've, got, I've got Rachel and then Jennifer, and then um, I'll ask a second question that we can blast through, then we'll open it up to everybody. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, thanks for the invitation, Dylan. I'm really grateful to be in conversation with these people I admire so, so much. And as often happens, Dean raised lots of the many things that are on my mind. Um, and Dean keeps it real. So, uh, and I, that's one of the things I love about you, Dean. And the fact of you keeping things real, <clears throat> excuse me, also allows me to focus, I think, more on the creative possibilities part of the question. So I'm going to think about what's possible rather than what is. Can you introduce um, yourself real quick, Rachel, too? Oh, I'm so sorry. It's okay. Yeah, thank you, Dylan. My name is Rachel Herzing. I have no pronoun preference. Um, I'm calling in today from Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe land in um, the Adirondacks, which is not where I normally am, but it's where I am today. Um, and, you know, I think part of the fact of spending most of my time for the past 20 odd years with people hatching schemes about revolt of some scale or another. And I appreciate Dorothy, you saying, you know, whether they're creative or not, um, I think puts me in a position of thinking um, a lot about what's possible. Uh, and so, you know, for me, I think a period of crisis is also a period ripe with possibility. Um, and I think we saw that last year um, in really, really interesting ways. You know, so for instance, we are 
in a crisis around housing. And we have been told for decades that there is no possible way to offer eviction relief for people. Turns out, not so. Totally possible to do that. And I think that changes the, the baseline of what, what we can demand, what our expectations are about housing. And the fact that people have continued to organize and mobilize around extending um, the eviction moratorium, I think, speaks to the possibility of more and better in the future. Same again with releases from prison, right? We've been told for decades and decades, under no circumstances can anybody get out of prison ever, even if they're about to die in prison, right? Too dangerous. Turns out not so. We can release people um, under, under these kind of very, very hard one and all too minimal um, releases around COVID, but it's possible to do that. Same with offering um, financial relief. No, it wouldn't be possible to offer financial relief to people in the United States. Completely possible to offer, you know, minimal and insufficient, but some amount of relief. And so I think that these kind of shifts um, expand what what we can expect, what we can demand, and they um, broaden the horizon of possibility for us. And they change the baseline, they change the terrain. And I think, you know, those kind of openings have also compelled us or invited us into new social arrangements and expectations of each other as well, right? And Dylan and Dean, I know that the two of you spent a lot of time in the past year and previous years working on mutual aid projects. And that's kind of one of the ways that we've seen this shift in expectations around social arrangements. And I think Dean and I have a difference of opinion about kind of, you know, the what, how central us helping each other should be versus the state playing some role in that. But that's that's a debate for another time. Um, but I think what they what does happen under there is again this kind of expanded sense of what is possible to expect from each other or demand from each other or ask of each other. And um, and then I think when we imagine that also within the context of what some are calling the largest protest movement in US history. We know that increasingly on, on the heels of Occupy, on the heels of Standing Rock, on the heels of, you know, series of mobilizations under the slogan Black Lives Matter, that people can be activated quickly and at a big scale if they understand the stakes. And I think that shifts again, the possibility of, um, of what we can ask for and demand of each other. And so I think, you know, when it comes to, the many concerns that Eddie raised, for instance, what what the possibility is, and you know, to remind ourselves that possibilities and the realities don't always line up. But when we're thinking about the possibilities of addressing all of those kind of many challenges that Eddie laid out for us, and and if we're imagining that we can rearrange our social relations, we can rearrange our our relationship to capitalism, to the state, et cetera then we have different terrain on which to fight. We manage to shift our conditions in ways that shift our possibilities. And I'm, I'm really enthusiastic about that. And I hope we can continue to kind of push the envelope on um, what our baseline demands are. That's a, that's a beautiful way to ease us into, into this next phase of, of, of our discussion. And then, and then um, Jennifer, you got the last word on this first one. And then, and then I'll, 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 I'll mix up our order a little bit, you all. Thank you, Jennifer. This is my first time meeting Jennifer, everybody. So thank you, Jennifer, for joining us. I appreciate you accepting my invitation despite not knowing me. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And I, I am familiar with most of you all here. So I'm, I'm just so honored to be amongst such powerful, brilliant, heavy hitters. So thank you so much. Um, I'm probably the youngest person on this panel. So um, it is a little intimidating, but again, I'm honored. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Tamu Nawikema. Uh, my name is Jennifer Marley, and I am a citizen of the Pueblo of San Ildefonso here in New Mexico. I am a PhD student um, at the American Studies Department at U UNM, um, and I'm also an organizer with the Red Nation. Um, so yeah, so I've, I've been just writing some notes to myself. Um, I guess I want to kind of start talking, uh, start off by talking about um, 
you know, the omnipresence of border town violence for indigenous people, right? To be off the reservation is to be criminal inherently. And um, this is actually something, I mean, it's border town violence and the and striving for border town justice that is really the, the basis of the Red Nation and why we came to be. And um, I wanted to um, talk about how I think one of the biggest obstacles for creative possibilities um, you know, against carcerality is um, talking about the fight against neoliberalism and individualism, right? I think that there is almost a carceral culture created even around social media. We're always looking to youth and young people and the way discourse kind of gets um, muddled in the realm of social media. And so, you know, the, the infamous cancel culture um, in many ways can contribute to the normalization of culturality, um, you know, even in just our everyday interactions with each other, we become the police, we police each other, we police each other's behaviors and, and opinions um, that we put out there. And um, that that is the ultimate enemy of collectivity, which I truly believe is what we need to give people to give people the chance to be better. Um, and in addition to that, like we were always thinking about um, people's material conditions. And so I have to remind myself that uh, revolutionaries, they're products of their material conditions. And if revolutionaries are, are coming from the most marginalized people, they're coming from the worst material conditions. So they're going to be imperfect to say the least. And, um, you know, so there's this patience that we need to have with each other. And, you know, I always think about um, Leslie Mormon Silko, well-known, um, you know, Pueblo author and scholar. And um, she always in her books depicted the protagonist as very imperfect, very faulted, um, as criminal, you know, according to, you know, how we understand, you know, criminal through, you know, settlers, the settler states, you know, set of laws. And um, she herself was excommunicated from her Pueblo um, for the crime of simply being honest about the reality of things or being honest about history. And um, of course, you know, there was also misogyny that contributed to that. But I'm always thinking about, um, you know, the fact that it's going to be it's going to be the rugged aunties and uncles who have the revolution in their hands. Right. It's going to be the so-called troubled youth who carry us forward. And that's something we're always reminding ourselves of in Red Nation, even, you know, when we have conflict with each other or conflict with other community members is uh, remembering where we come from and why we are the way we are. Um, the other day, uh, I was on a panel with the Honorable Verna Teller from Isleta Pueblo, and um, she's the first female judge in her Pueblo, and um, she's very committed to um, restoring traditional means of peacekeeping, and um, she, she said, quote, the feds have been imposing their form of justice on us, and um, she's, she, as a judge, is, like, committed to rejecting um, you know, US legal means of punishment, which is, is very profound. And I don't, you know, consider it to be like, you know, changing things from within, because she's actually not trying to do that. She's actually trying to rebuild and restore um, that which has been stripped from us. And so I look to her and people like her um, for guidance in that way. Um, and then somebody brought up um, the commodification of art itself, of the arts. Um, and I think that's a really big deal. That's something that I've been writing about and thinking about more um, because my um, Pueblo is actually in close proximity to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And if you know anything about that place, it's, um, you know, it's every, you know, wealthy white person's art mecca, right? Like um, it's, it's a place that's, you know, hyper gentrified. It's a very violent border town. And, um, um, you know, the, I, I recently wrote a piece in which I framed the art industry as an extractive industry, not unlike, you know, the, the resource extraction industries that are constantly siphoning the life and wealth from our lands here, because the art industry is, has become something that siphons, you know, culture, labor, and, and money from us. Uh, historically, I come from an art family, and, you know, seeing firsthand the impacts of that makes it very clear that, uh, you know, when the arts are commodified, they they become the exact opposite as it uh, the, they become the exact opposite of a tool for revolution, and even um, contemporary artists, native artists who 
um, are making more radical political art, in many cases refuse to be associated with movements on the ground because they're still depending on it for their livelihood. Therefore, they're depending on, um, you know, the funds and the opinions of, you know, wealthy white buyers typically. And um, yeah, as far as solutions go, um, I just want to say, I think we're in a very critical moment where people are ready to move, people are ready to fight, and they need guidance, they need, um, they need hope, and they need something to look to. Um, I know some comrades of mine were saying that, um, you know, there was such success when Trump was elected because, um, you know, people, um, especially poor and working class people, were looking to Trump as a revolutionary alternative, right? What he was saying was... Um, uh, you know, against what, what they understood to be the neoliberalism of the U.S. state, which in, in some ways it was. And so if we don't provide an alternative for people, alternatives like that will continue to appear. And what did, you know, what, what was galvanized in the aftermath of Trump's election? Well, we saw um, a semi-organized um, overtaking of the Capitol, right? And so this is what happens when um, we are, you know, we on the left are, you know, those of us who are abolitionists, um, you know, don't come in um, and able to provide the masses with an alternative. And so um, I want to encourage us as we think about what that alternative looks like to take the lead of our relatives in the global south. Um, that's something that um, in Red Nation we're always looking at. We're always, you know, internationalism was of the utmost importance to us. And um, it's because their indigenous people and poor and working class people have um, popular movements. They have power and they have the backing of their people um, to actually take state power. And that's what they do. And you know, this results in not only success for mass movements um, and allows these nations to protect themselves from imperialist invasion, um, but it also increases the autonomy of individuals because it, it betters their material conditions. It allows people to live a dignified life, to become human again in a world that constantly rewards being so inhuman. And so I want to end there and I want to end with a quote from my comrade who says, uh, what is an organizer but an artist of the real world? Thank you. There's always a tendency in these discussions when we have um, an early, an early career, you know, early grad student, early career colleague like Jennifer to, um, to address them as a student. And I think we need not do that today. <laughs> I think Jennifer, you very clearly articulated, um, some ideas and some praxis and some wisdom here that, um, make you very much a colleague and comrade. So I just, again, I want to extend my thanks to you for, for joining us here and being part of this discussion. Um, so I have a second opening question. This is a quicker one because we don't have to introduce ourselves now. We did that. Um, and this is, I put it in chat. This is just asking each of our panelists to offer us an example. Um, that's it, just an example, you all. Um, it's just to keep us moving. This kind of echoes, uh, again, what, what I think multiple folks here have already started to do. Um, if you wanna emphasize the examples you've already raised, that's fine, let's do that. If there's something else you wanna bring forward, please do that. But I think the moment, the possibility, I think Rachel, you're the one that put it that way is the one that we wanna prevail on here. That's what revolt does. Revolt creates possibilities for other kinds of things, you know, other kinds of imagination, um, other ways of being. Um, so yeah, let's, let's go through this. And then, and then you all that are here in attendance, please start thinking about your questions, your comments. Um, and I'm gonna open, open it right up as soon as our panelists go through the second question so we can spend some time in conversation with each other. So Eddie, I, I, I cut you short earlier, so I'm gonna pick on you first. I'm gonna let you, and it also, I think this question also, you know, also gets at some of the things you were starting to talk about in your opening thoughts. So, so Eddie, I'll start with you. So I'll go, I'll put in, I'll put to the panelists, I'll put the order that I wanna call on you all right now. Eddie, if you don't mind. On mute, okay. Um... Uh, uh, let, let, let's look at jury nullification for a minute there. Somewhere back in the past in Tyler, Texas, uh, several white police ran into the wrong house, ran upstairs, uh, shot to death a 80 some year old woman in her bed. Um, uh, later on, it was discovered that they should have been next door. Uh, 
but she was unarmed and she was she was startled when they broke in her room so she set up and they shot her and it was a uh, all white police uh the police end up having an all white jury and they found the police not guilty the black community in response to that did a, a thing called jury nullification. They decided that from then on in, any black person that went up in front of a judge and a jury that did not harm the black community, they would release them. They would vote not guilty for them, even if they hung the jury up. And they did this process for a, a couple of years and uh, it collapsed the jury and the criminal justice system. They had to move it from Tyler, Texas to somewhere else, but it was effective. And it's a process that was used then. It can be used again. Uh, and it should be used uh, in communities of color when the person that's being tried did not do anything that harmed the black community whether they were jaywalking or they broke a window or they stole an apple or whatever it was, if it did not harm the black community, they should be released. And I think that's one example. Uh, another example probably is uh, North New Jersey, uh, Baraka, the mayor up there, is just transforming the police department completely. Um, and in other places, there's requirements to move police within the jurisdiction in which they police. Uh, and they, their behavior changes immediately. That doesn't solve the problem, but that gives the community some control and some input. And so it's examples like that that uh, I think we should look toward right now uh, in terms of where we at historically. But um, I'm, I, I am concerned, we're at a crossroads. You know, we're standing between saving the planet and having a fascist government uh, insert itself in the next couple of years. And um, uh, I agree with Dean, we have to look at proliferation. We have to look at, we can jump back to the French Revolution, in fact, and you'll see that there were 10,000 little organized saloons in France before that revolution jumped off. But each one of them were doing their particular thing and each one of them were organizing. But when the, the stuff hit the fan, they all came out. And there was no way to target one group or a group because it was 10 thousands. Uh, and that's what we need to be thinking about here. Yeah, this I'm is great. Yeah. No, no, that's excellent. Thank you, thank you, Eddie. See, look, I didn't even, I didn't even have to, I didn't even have to cut you off this time. It was beautiful. Thank you. The second question, y'all, just to remind um, my, my co-panelists, I put it in chat and I didn't read out loud. The second question we're, we're going through with our with our um, with our group is: Are there current, recent, or long ago examples of anti-carceral, that is, abolitionist, and or proto-abolitionist forms of creativity, movement, or community making that we should be reflecting on during this moment? So, um, Eddie, thanks for getting us going with that. Uh, and let me let me um, shift it over uh, to our next respondent. Let me go to David. Thanks, Dylan. And um, I also agree. Uh, I'm glad Eddie brought it back to this proliferation of you know small acts, small groups all over the place. Um, but I also wanted to go back to Eddie's vein of some of kind of like a practical form of reform. And I'm thinking of forms of decriminalization. That could occur, you know, at, you know, on multiple levels, the federal level, the state level, city, on your college campus. Um, but the, the example I like to think of is um, uh, in immigration uh, law, if, if, you are in the, if, if you are convicted of or sentenced to anything that's 365 days or longer in the criminal courts, that triggers deportation in the, in the, in the immigration system. Uh, so you serve your 365 and then you, then you get deported. Uh, what the state of California did as an act of decriminalization, they lowered the maximum misdemeanor to 364 days, thereby removing the trigger towards deportation. And, and, and um, you know, thousands and thousands of people no longer are separated from their families for a misdemeanor, you know. Um, 
And I think even these small, you know, bureaucratic, an eye towards these small bureaucratic changes can, can have an effect. Um, of course, there's always a limit to these as well. We have to think about, you can, you can create drug reform programs for certain people, but they still will trigger for other certain people, immigrants in this case, uh, deportation nonetheless. Even if you, go, you don't get sentenced, but you do drug reform, you still get deported for, the, for that drug thing or just decriminalize marijuana. What about everyone who was in the temporal sense was criminalized by marijuana, you know? And so you have to sort of have an eye to both the, those limitations, but I still think uh, there's a lot of ways uh, to um, use decriminalization on multiple levels um, to, uh, to help decarcerate. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Sandy, I got you next, go. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to give a quick list here. I mean, mention the ones I already uh, mentioned, which is uh, decolonize space and strike MoMA. Um, in terms of, um, you know, examples, I think a lot of coalitional indigenous movements and peoples and communities have been the example um, of revolt for so long. I think uh, in my own communities, whether it's going back to um, pre-Incan, even pre-Incan modes of uh, liberating water uh, for our peoples that are more effective than anything engineers can do and, and having a lot of those efforts now being recognized uh, by government. Um, and I think of language, you know, um, there's a way in which e even, you know, English language in particular, like if we, the ways in which carceral logics, I think are just inherent to language is something um, to think about. So, um, you know, I always advocate for folks to, to learn uh, indigenous language. Um, there's 10,000 Quechua speakers. So, you know, go for Quechua. It's not easy, but you could do it. Um, and then even, you know, other ways in which we're shifting, um, shifting the bounds of discourse, our own discourse. Uh, I'm thinking most recently, of a book that should be out, I think publicly accessed, sourced um, by Keila Tompkins and Mishana Goman, editor of a new um, keywords. There's um, Keila right there. <laughs> woo woo, feminist from, you know, it, it's just, it, it, when we rethink how we just use language um, and, you know, foreground, um, um, you know, ways of being and knowing that have always been in a revolt, revolt uh, in this instance, I think critical feminist discourses, um, you know, I think we give our, we, we shift the bounds uh, in lots of different ways of our struggle. I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you, Sandy. Uh, I got Rachel, Jennifer, Dorothy, and Dean. Go for it, Rachel. All right, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break the rule and give two, but um, I'll, I'll do them quickly. So I just wanna say out loud always, Big ups to Jerome Miller um, and his um, example of shutting the training school system in Massachusetts. For anybody who believes it is impossible to shut down a prison system, this man did it. Um, and then the other thing that I'll mention briefly is something I've talked about um, before, but I think is good for this, this audience, which is um, the Greek sanctuary campus movement, uh, whereby um, you know, cops were not allowed to pursue protesters and, um, you know, and leftists in general onto college campuses. And that was a no-go zone for them. And I know there have been some experiments with that um, here in the United States as well. And I want to give a shout to everybody who are working on the cops off campuses stuff, because it's really, really inspiring. But um, those are the two that I'll offer. I think, you know, whenever we believe something can't happen, I guess this is my theme today. When we believe something can't happen, we get some kind of example of how it actually could happen. And I think those are two. That's outstanding. Um, Rachel, I'm gonna put uh, an article up about Jerome Miller in the chat for folks that might not be familiar with his work, but if you have one and you can do it, maybe you might have like a better article. I found one by Vinny Shiraldi that I was gonna That's a up. good one. It yeah, is, okay, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll put that put up that for everybody one. so y'all can learn Thank from this you. example. Yeah, it's a beautiful example, um, a historic example. Um, no, thank you. Uh, I've got, I've got, I've got uh, Jennifer, Dorothy, and Nadine. Yeah, I'm gonna give a few very, very brief examples um, just to kind of tie them together. So, I mean, a lot of times when we 
uh, you know, are asked by, you know, people like, well, what do we do with the most violent perpetrators without police? Um, you know, the community won't have, uh, won't be able to successfully like reprimand them or capture them. But I want to remind people, and this is kind of a silly example, but, um, but it adds up. Um, Richard Ramirez, when he was when he was like running away, when he was about to be caught, it was his own community where he grew up, his own, like it was a Chicano community that reprimanded him, captured him, kicked his ass. And like to think that we wouldn't look out for each other and ourselves without police is like ridiculous to me because we know that that happens all the time. And um, another example of something like that happening was at Standing Rock when there was um, a pedophile um, in the camps who was, um, you know, actively preying on people. He was publicly humiliated. He was uh, by a group of women, older women. Um, he had his hair cut off and was exiled from the camp. And I know these seem like pretty rough examples, but, um, you know, it just, it's, it's really ridiculous when people act like, you know, people won't reprimand um, people who do heinous things. But also, let's remember, uh, you know, why do violent criminals exist or why does violent crime exist it's again it's a result of you know capitalism colonialism imperialism white supremacy heteropatriarchy and it's constantly normalized you know and so um you know in the case of Richard Ramirez for example uh, he learned how to stalk and torture people from his uncle who was in Vietnam torturing people in Vietnam so it's a he's a direct product of U.S. imperialism and we know that you know, when our native men are committing violent crimes, they are, again, like, uh, you know, that's a result of years and years of, you know, sexual exploitation and abuse by colonizers who knew that that was such an effective tool, um, you know, for traumatizing people and repressing people. And so, uh, you know, we need to look at the sources of why violent crime exists and know that it's not just a given or inherent in, in a society. Um, and then my last example, is um, I look to my own uh, people, Pueblo people, and how we, um, you know, gave a normalized critique of each other. And um, I won't go into detail about this, but um, among our sacred people were um, the clowns. And people don't know this, but their job was actually um, to critique and put leaders in their place. And they did this through humor, um, through what we would call today, like roasting people or just, you know, literally clowning on people. And it was in the form of a joke to, you know, keep um, things lighthearted, but they were very real and very in-depth political critiques. And, you know, these people were also knowledge keepers, storytellers. So they were the holders of our history, um, but also played a very significant role in um, our politics and governance system and how our leadership conducted themselves. And so, like, I, you know, it, when people um, talk about like new and creative possibilities, I'm like, we definitely have evidence. Um, and in many cases, still very intact ways um, to carry out our own peacekeeping and justice um, as native people. So I'll end there. There's something, there's something really important, I think, about what Jennifer raised here about the um, autonomous forms of conceptualizing, not to mention implementing what is too commonly presumed to be this notion of justice, right? That we actually can complicate how it is that we understand justice, how we understand the implementation of safety and consequences and things like that. So that's, I actually, I, I really appreciate the examples you gave, Jennifer, because they're not easy ones for some folks to take in. So I, I'm, I'm down with that. Thank you. Um, I got Dorothy, then Dean, then we will open up the floor, everybody, so get your questions and comments ready. Okay. So I would like to lift up again the emerging movement to abolish the child welfare system or family policing, which is being led mostly by black mothers who've been caught up in it and who've had their children taken from them. And also increasingly children who've been stolen from their families and confined to a very dangerous, harmful, unsafe foster care system. Uh, and I, I also want to make the point that my work has been mostly with Black organizers, but it's important to note the long history of U.S. state stealing of Indigenous children as a literal weapon of war, and that Native tribes have been fighting against this form of war and terror that is taking children uh, for centuries. Uh, and the Red Nation included 
child stealing in its abolitionist demands. As far as I could tell, it was the only abolitionist group that included it. And I wanna give a shout out for that. Uh, th these mothers have so much courage. We were talking about courage earlier. They have so much to lose because the state could come in and take their children at any moment. Some of them still have children in foster care, which means they might not ever get them back because of their resistance, but they're the most outspoken and bold of any organizers I've ever met. Uh, they're organizing to dismantle the child welfare system by shrinking it and mitigating the terror that it inflicts on families, but also creating caring ways of actually providing material supports for families and actually keeping children safe. And uh, I'll just mention uh, a few <laughs> um, of these, and, but, but let me say that it's such a, a good example and model of proliferation because these are at least begin with really small groups of mothers who get together in communities to support each other. And some of them have become, you know, more, uh, more uh, bigger and stronger and more influential in opposing child protective services. But all of them emerge from these really small collectives of uh, people who are involved in just trying to support each other. Uh, there was an encampment in Philadelphia of unhoused mothers and children that actually won a victory from the city and got housing for their families. Uh, there's an organization called DHS Give Us Back Our Children, which is in Philly and also in Los Angeles, and JMAC for Families in New York City, which was founded by a just amazing organizer, Joyce McMillan, who had her daughters taken from her for several years. And she has a legislative agenda to abolish mandated reporting, to stop drug testing of newborns, which is one of the major ways that Black mothers have their kids, uh, their babies, their newborn babies taken from them, uh, to repeal some federal legislation called the Adoption Safe Families Act, which emphasized adoption over returning children home, uh, but also providing concrete supports like diapers you know, to families who need them. Uh, and this kind of everyday work that Dean was talking about. And I, I just wanna mention one more thing, which Rachel reminded me of when talking about possibilities, things that people say could never happen and happen. So there are lots of people who say, we can't possibly keep children safe without the child welfare system, monitoring families, investigating them, taking children away. But there's a, a professor named Anna Ahrens at NYU who recently wrote an article on a temporary abolition of child protective services in New York City during COVID, the, the COVID lockdown, because during that time, the courts were not adjudicating these cases, caseworkers weren't going out and taking children, and everybody said, you know, there were these reports in the newspaper, oh, children are going to be abused, and it turned out that children were safer during that period when ACS, the Administration for Children's Services, wasn't going around investigating and taking children. And the main reason they were safer was because there was this proliferation of mutual aid that went on during the COVID not lockdown. And also because there were checks going out from the Biden administration directly to families without strings attached, without having to be investigated. And those two actions uh, kept children safer than the kind of terroristic system we have now. So we do have these examples that abolition can work. And I'm, I'm really excited about uh, how this focus uh, on abolishing child welfare and people organizing around it can even give you know, inspiration to the longer standing, in some ways, movement to abolish prisons and police. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, I put I put your classic text up there in the chat as well, so folks can um, go back to it. I know everyone here's probably here has probably already read it, but let's go back to it constantly because I yeah I think it sets up the whole framework for this. Um, shameless uh, <laughs> shameless plug, you all. Um, 
Ab uh, Kaepernick Publishing just put out its uh, the, the hard copy version of Abolition for the People yesterday. It just came out. I'll put a link up in the chat. A bunch of our folks um, from the movement have published these short articles in it, including Dean, um, myself, you know, Mariam Kaba, Robin Kelly, Mumia Abu Jamal, uh, you know, Andrea Ritchie, like a, a ton of a ton of us. Folks. Sorry if I missed you if you're in here and I missed you, but a, a bunch of our folks are in there, and it's um. It's a beautiful volume because everything is so short. It's useful for all kinds of different pedagogical contexts. It also provokes exactly the kind of dynamic, um, ongoing, critical thinking and collective study around abolition that Dorothy is urging us to do. So thank you. Dean, close us out on the second question and we'll open it up to everybody else. Yeah, um, I mean, you all have said so many things that are like, my brain is in a thousand places. Um, but this piece of what, what Rachel said, which is so true about how crisis is opportunity. And also like Rachel gave me like a flashback to how I felt towards the beginning of the pandemic, where it's like, people are talking about universal basic income and people, and they're extending all these benefits and they're blocking evictions. Like what is possible? And, and then, and also the rollbacks, but you know, how, how that's felt, but it was cool for me to like, take that journey, you know, um, about this point, which is so true, which is that disaster is creates rifts in like current reality and like what happens in those rifts and like. On the one hand, we all know that one of the things that happens is like the government rolls in with like a bunch of tanks, you know, and like we should be and like FEMA doesn't show up. Like we know that disaster is often, you know, a, a moment for further extraction, further reorganization towards, you know, white supremacy and capitalism in various ways. And we know that people show up in like, and I love what Jennifer was saying, because it's like, it's about like how deeply pragmatic people are. And this is, I feel like what we all get out of Miriam Kaba's work. She's just like, always like, oh yeah, just do the thing. Like, just try the things, yeah. experiment with them, make them, it's like abolition is about these like incredibly pragmatic, immediate, like, oh, like you can't live with your parents. You're in an abusive situation. How can your community take care of you? What would be the right break for you? How could we support your parents to not keep doing that? Like, instead of this kind of like, let's organize a giant system that takes children away from black people and native people. You know, like, it's like, there's like, you know, this kind of abolition draws us back into our pragmatism. So I guess the examples that I thought about with this question were a lot about that. I thought about when Hurricane Maria um, tore up Puerto Rico and I have a very beloved dear friend who, who lives there. And she talked about how, she lives in this big apartment building and she talked about the kinds of things people did for each other throughout the apartment building, you know, take care of the elders and different vulnerable people in the group. And she talked about what she wanted to do to be prepared for the next storm. And like how she wished that she had, was more prepared to facilitate a meeting with hundreds of people to talk about coordinating coordinating some of those things in the building. Or it was just like this very pragmatic, like now that I've been through this, what's it like when the lights go out? She bought a certain kind of solar battery afterwards. Like just like this very pragmatic. So part of it is like, I think, can we look to places where people, um, which are all over the place, have, you know, what ha the, the, the freezing weather that came through Texas last year, like what did people, what worked? And what if people wish they had more already in place? Like that's because everything we're facing is just like these cascading disasters of the long-term disasters we've already been in for hundreds of years, plus the climate acceleration disasters that are, you know, exacerbate everything. So I'm curious about that. And I think, I also think a lot about the pragmatism of groups like Young Women's Empowerment Project, which doesn't exist anymore, but was around for many years in Chicago and supported people, young people in the sex trades and just had these, like, if you look at their reports and stuff, just like these very pragmatic solutions for like safety and well-being for the situations that young people in the sex trades find themselves in that were, you know, an, an, it's an anti-police organization that knows that that's not the solution. Um, and I also think about like the Safe Outside the System Collective and Audrey Lord Project. Um, I think about like the materials on the mutual aid disaster relief website, just like these, like where are people just like, okay, knowing what's likely to show up with whatever disasters they're facing and then like sorting out pragmatic steps and how can we get more people doing more of that on the front end of whatever the next ex exacerbation of disaster is like, or how, or for the, or for just the ongoing unfolding constant disasters of things like the family regulation system or the prison system, how can we help more people be mobilized for collective action on that instead of just trying to like eke through alone or with their family member and like have, have no one on their side, you know? And I think that my desire in this, as we face these disasters is just that more people experience deep accompaniment in these situations that I don't think are about to stop having us have extreme suffering, but just that there be like a level of collectivity in the face of these things. I think it isolation is the most dangerous thing in our society. Like going through these things alone is so much more deadly than going through them with any kind of community or support 
even if you can't get somebody immediately out of the situation. So I'm just thinking about, about that and about disaster as a place of, um, of learning what our next pragmatic steps are. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. As we open it up to the folks that are here, you, you, you know, all of you making me think of um, a couple levels of um, dealing with the whole casualty management imperative that um, I think all of us here are drawn into in all these different ways. And how, Dean, you put a point on this, that the way, the way that the way that anti-Blackness and colonialism and you know, these forms of genocide work is to individualize the casualties and by extension to individualize casualty management. So it's isolated, demoralizing, humiliating, and all this kind of stuff. And then there's this other possibility that you're pushing us toward, actually all y'all pushing us toward. What happens when you not only collectivize um, and therefore attach a different kind of politics to the experience of casualty, Right, make it like this is a collective casualty that we're experiencing, but also collectivize casualty management itself. You know, that, that if we have to be involved in this kind of emergency triage to help each other, that politicizing and, and uh, politicizing is probably the wrong word, right? But um, just collectivizing, thinking about it in this as part of this long archive of trying to stave off elimination, stave off liquidation, stave off capture, stave off the frontier, right? Stave off chattel, stave off the plantation um, and fuck it, burn the plantation down, right? All that stuff, like that's all part of how we can think about the way the emergency work of casualty management can actually form a base. It can actually form a base to bring people into this work and to understand the condition um, as one that requires constant insurgency and something beyond insurgency at some point as well. Um, enough of me, let's open the floor up to everybody here. Uh, please use, feel free to use the raise your hand function. If you're not comfortable doing that, feel free to use the chat, do whatever you like. But we have a precious about half hour left with our folks here. So let's, let's do this. Um, and I'll do my best to facilitate this. So don't make me go through uncomfortable silence here, participants, attendees. So, somebody, somebody either raise your hand or just unmute and start talking. I'm cool with whatever you want to do. Keila, did you have something? I'm picking on you because you were the first one I saw to go. Okay. <laughs> it's got a finger wag. <laughs> My face is being supportive. Okay. Okay. Uh, Matthew, did you want to say something? I saw you go on camera, Matthew. No? Okay. Okay. I'll just say hi to Sandy and Jen. Uh, what's up i know it's been a while but miss miss hanging out with you two and talking with you too <laughs> that's okay we can just do this we can do this as a reuniting moment too that's cool too <laughs> shout out to the standing rock syllabus still going strong <laughs> right on right on attendees we've heard from we've heard from our panelists you've heard from me attendees who wants to who wants to offer an opening an opening provocation or question or even just thoughts it doesn't have to be a question it can just be it can just be reflections on what um what we've talked about here so far in the last in the last hour hour and 15 minutes all right all right they're y'all are terrible students huh all right i have something for you i got something for the panelists but i'm asking the third question now so i'm i'm really being self-indulgent please interrupt me if i don't see any raised hands okay I have a question okay, for y'all. Okay. Yeah, okay, good. I'll Thank you. I'll do it for you. I'll do it for you. You rescued everybody from me. Thank you. Go, Keila. Go, Keila, go. Don't grade me on this question. All right. So here's uh, I've been something I've been thinking a lot about is a back channel um, at my own workplace. One thing, one of the ways that we've organized is um, is just by creating new back channels. And as I, um, as we've, and we've been really effective in, for instance, last week we stopped the, um, the institution from firing an elder, um, an elder in, at, in, uh, in my workplace, um, uh, uh, an elderly, I'm, I'm, I'm entitled to uh, share her information, but an older woman who, um, African-American woman, former Black Panther who refuses to vaccinate and they started procedures to fire her and we just stopped it uh, and, it's, and made them back down. And so um, I guess my question is, um, uh, I wonder if we can think about like the first steps to collectivizing just feel really hard, right? Like it's it feels um, hard, even though it's exactly the right thing to do. And so I'm wondering if for those of you doing organizing, 
um, you could you could think with me about those first steps from an individualized a, a response to a, a collectivized action. Um, and I mean, like really materially, I'm talking about like pamphlets, phone calls, texts, emails, uh, back channel emails, um, signal. What is that? What are those first moments? What are those first material strategies? Uh, or, or can you talk to us about... Um, yeah, just like the material uh, actions that led to the energy and momentum of collectivized change uh, taking place. Who wants to go, who wants to take that on? This is a great question. This is a very catalyzing conversation. I think, I think a, lot of, a lot of us are sitting here just taking it in, but um, that's what makes it, I think, challenging to do this. But who, who, who can, who can think, help us think about Akilah's provocation here? Go, oh, Jennifer. I'll just say something brief. So, um, I mean, yeah, I think you're right with, you know, listing all these communications platforms um, because I think it requires just opening lines of communications, creating networks of organizers, right? And, you know, these networks don't necessarily need to be, um, you know, like working on the same campaign necessarily even, but just creating these networks of support goes a very long way and just being aware of what's happening in different places. I think, you know, a lot of times there's just emphasis on like the community, the community, are you from the community? Um, but when we get caught up looking at only um, our local areas, it limits, uh, you know, possibilities, it limits um, ideas and creativity and just, you know, camaraderie. And so I think, um, being aware of what's happening in other places, taking note of each other's tactics and um, being prepared to support when needed, when called upon, um, being prepared to, you know, even travel in some cases, which is, you know, it's difficult uh, and everyone has different capacities, but, um, you know, knowing who your comrades are is, is a great place to start, I think. I could, that, that uh, really resonates with me, Jennifer, and, um, relates to what I was saying at the beginning about creative possibilities and understanding that carceral logics, you know, flow through and, and, and influence and shape and govern so many different institutions and systems and policies that at first may not seem as if they're connected, but when you see they're connected, then there's this opportunity for collective action. And I was thinking when you, when, um, uh, is it Keila? Yeah, uh, asked the question, I was thinking about, okay, what's a, what's a victory I could think of uh, that, that you know, I was engaged in that recently. And one was uh, the New York, uh, the people in charge of deciding whether you can test babies for drugs without consent uh, came out and said that New York City hospitals should stop doing it. You know, so right now, New York City hospitals, the ones that are in Black and Brown communities, test babies and report positive drug tests to CPS. And the ones that are in white neighborhoods and have, you know, wealthy middle-class white patients don't do it. So it is such an obvious case of blatant racism in the child welfare system. Um, and so what, what got uh, this victory was the organizing of black mothers whose babies have been taken away from them based on a positive drug test with family defenders in New York City. These are, pub well, they're, they're in, they're not public defenders so much as they have, they're law offices that have a, a, a component that's focused on defending families against CPS. Um, they usually include social workers, you know, who are <laughs> connected to the system and, um, and, and, and community members as well. Uh, so uh, those people, and then also an organization, new organization called Movement for Family Power in New York City, and really importantly, the Drug Policy Alliance, which is working on uh, ending the war on drugs. So th these were 
people who recognize that the war on drugs is happening in hospitals against black mothers. Uh, and when they saw those connections, they were able to come together, work together and, and advocate for this change in New York City hospital policy. You know, again, it's not, it's just one blow against this system that, that mitigates its harm, that shrinks the system. It's not total abolition, but it means that there will be fewer Black mothers whose babies are taken from them from hospitals in New York City. Yeah, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a fracture within a larger detonation is the way I want to think about it, <laughs> yeah. right? Like it contributes yeah. to an actual collapse rather than, you know, an incremental reformist approach that actually strengthens the foundation of it. So yeah, it's, it's just, it, I mean, it, we're thinking. Exactly. Shrink, sh how can we shrink it? How can yeah. we keep children from being taken That's right. from their families? Yeah, you it's know, like, how do you destroy it? Yeah, to dismantle the whole yeah. thing. And of course, at the, as I was saying before, at the same time, we are working on ways to, to support and care for mothers who may have drug problems. Now they don't all have drug problems. That's the other thing. They don't have drug problems. There's this conflation of if you use drugs, you must be a bad parent. And that's something we're also working to, you know, disabuse the public of, you know, and policies of implementing. But but there are some people who do, but they, the solution isn't to take their babies from them. That only harms the babies and them. You know, so anyway. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Hey, thank you all. We're starting to pop off in the chat, which is awesome. Um, and 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 by the way, we don't we never get to everything that people want to raise here in any sufficient way. So I want to encourage everyone who's here to think about the stuff that's coming up in the conversation and in the chat, which we're not going to adequately address as opportunities to catalyze other kinds of conversations from today. That's kind of, that's why. This was supposed to be a two-part conversation, was, which is why this panel, this discussion was called part one. But I left the part one in there because I want y'all to think about a part two through a million on this, right? Like a continuity beyond this ASA thing that y'all can take in other places. Um, so please do that. Like, look at the stuff that's coming up in these, in these conversations. Look at the stuff that's in the chat and read it and take it in. Um, I got Rachel and then Dean responding to this. And then I'll try to go to the, to the chat, um, to some of the stuff that came up in chat and to call on you all that are in the chat to kind of raise your points before we run out of time. Rachel, go ahead. Great. So I'm going to offer something that's, I think, very obvious, but in my experience, sometimes stating the obvious is also helpful. Um, and this gets a little bit, I think, to your question as well, Matthew. I think the, the number one thing for me, Keila, in thinking about what you've raised is to think about what's at stake. So I 100% agree with both Jennifer and Dorothy that you got to figure out who your people are and then figure out effective ways of getting in communication with them, staying in communication with them. But I think even before that, you need clarity about what's at stake to figure out who your people are, right? Um, and I, I say that it's obvious, but maybe bears saying in part because I feel like that, that's a step that frequently feels like it's getting skipped these days for me when the emphasis seems to be so much more on protest than on long-term organizing. The move to mobilization is instant, but sometimes it lacks that kind of foundation of like what binds us all together in this fight, especially if it's not a fight that's based on identity or geography necessarily, right? Um, and that also gets me to a little bit to your question about sustainability, Matthew, because I think if you don't have clarity of purpose, if you don't understand what's at stake, if you don't understand where the shared fate is, it is a lot more difficult to sustain yourself after the peak period of protest is over, when it's kind of the doldrums, the day-to-day, -day, like non-sexy, like who's going to make the photocopies kind of daily grind of what most organizing is. I think you need to be um, you know, committed to, to what the stakes of the fight are and to not lose not lose sight of the fact that even after peak protest is over, the stakes don't necessarily change. And I think that's true regardless of, of the nonprofit industrial complex or not. I think that's just like plain and simple organizing 101. 
Go ahead, Dean. Yeah, this is there's so much good stuff in the chat too. Uh, um, I just wanted to, I mean, just to speak to that initial question about like, like I was just thinking about um, recently in the region I live in, there's like, you know, one of the little islands, it's its own city off of Seattle wants to build a new police station and another like little city nearby wants to build a new jail. And so it's like, I feel like for people in my circles, like when we hear about that, we're just like, okay, contact everybody you know. Do you know anybody who lives in this weird island full of rich people? Do you know, do we know anybody who teaches any of the schools there? Do we know anybody who works in social services there? Like just a, like you know, a million emails and texts and then you know putting things on social media like how can and you know the, I think a lot of what the, and you know getting urgency around it and also asking people who live other places to still call like call into the city council meeting there because it just like freaks out these people in these tiny communities who are on these city councils where they no one's ever said stop paying for more things for cops and jails you know and I think that what I, all I'm saying all I want the reasons I want to bring that up is just this sense of like the only resource we really have for our movements is people like that's like what we have the other side has everything else and so um the question is how do we make and this goes to matthew's thing in the chat like how do we make a culture of like deep inclusion for lots and lots of new people in this kind of work and we are very bad at that and i think what happens is a lot of people show up like moments like occupy or last summer all these times and it's like people don't figure out how to do what I think Rachel's also referring to, of like actually building sustained connection with each other and having that turn into a lot of projects and orgs where people like get a lot of deep political ed and stay in the work for the rest of their lives, which is like what we need. Like we don't need to just need people to show up like in the street for a month or for a week or for a night, you know? And so how do we do that? And I, um, so I, a lot of my, what my work is about these days is about like working with small groups where everybody's at volunteer about like, how are we gonna create a good culture inside every small group that keeps people together prevents and deals with conflict, um, welcomes new people instead of having the first three people who started it burn out and then the thing stops happening. Um, and I wanted to say that I'm giving a series of um, workshops that are about these kinds of issues that are very pragmatic and for people doing this kind of work um, coming up at Barnard and the first one's happening in October, there's like one a month and they're sliding scale to free. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to say, you know, and that also how do we be like less judgmental? How do we be rigorous but loving is one way I've heard it talked about. Like, how do we be like, oh yeah, I'm sorry, like in this meeting, we all try to call each other by each other's pronouns, but also like, we want you to stay. It's not like you have to go because you did it wrong once. Like we want, you know, like just how do we keep people in while still of course having standards about how we want to treat each other or having people be like, yeah, I want to seriously have a rigorous conversation with you about why I'm an abolitionist. And also like, you don't need to be, know you're one to walk into this room and organize with us against this jail, like all of that stuff. Um, and the last thing I just want to briefly um, address Melina's question about the state, because I think it is always like underlying all of these conversations, and I am really curious to hear Sandy talk about this too, um, and Rachel and everyone. Um, but I, you know, yes, I come to this for, as an anarchist. I didn't, I didn't learn this politics through anarchism. I, I feel like I learned it through my experiences and interpretations of women of color feminisms of different kinds. Um, but yeah, I don't think that the United States or any nation state will ever be something other than an extractive project. And I sincerely believe in engaging with existing state forms we must so I'm, i really care about the defund work and i really care about the work that's about dismantling and i really care about all this annoying work i do in the city and county councils trying to stop these new jail and police station projects i'm not interested in saying we shouldn't touch them those spaces but i am interested in knowing that the answers we need are never going to come from them but of course those things are devouring our communities so it's like yeah i'm gonna put a lot of time into trying to close the municipal court absolutely um, and i'm also going to fight against like right now one of my former students is running for city attorney in seattle and like ugh, do i believe in progressive prosecutors but i know that the lady she's running against is like trying to bring giuliani town to like seattle so no you know so i think it's like I'm interested in, and I think, and I th actually think most anarchists I know are in a really non-absolutist politics in terms of practice. Like I'll work with anyone to stop a jail. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people won't work with anarchists, but I will work with absolutely anyone who wants to stop the jail. And I will be honest about my, what I believe. Just, just like I think abolitionists are saying, we have, we're like, yeah, we'll work with anyone to stop the jail. And also we're gonna be honest about what we think the, the goal post is here instead of, um, you know, we want a new choking ban or whatever. Um, and so I think that, yeah, but, but for me, it's it's actually really, really, really clarifying to know that I don't think there could be um, good cops or good prisons or, uh, you know, like that the state project itself is defined by those things as all the scholars and activists here have told us and taught us for so long. And that um, the state function itself, its job is to redistribute wealth upwards, to concentrate wealth um, in ways that are deeply racialized and fundamentally colonial and imperialist. And so, um, yeah, I'm not trying to take it over, if that makes sense. And I just want to be like explicit about that because I think there's still actually a lot of um, stigma around um, having a conversation about anarchism even in, even in spaces yeah, like these often. So, yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dean. So, so I've got um, a few, a few things in, in the chat that I wanted to um, pay attention to. And, and Thelma, if, if you're, um, if you're there, I was going to ask you to maybe, you can read your question or you can maybe just talk about where the question's coming from. If that, if you're, if you're available, otherwise I could just read your question too. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for this amazing talk. Um, I also have a bunch of notes and I think that's kind of where this um, question came about and just thinking about the work that you're all doing that is very necessary, urgent. And I think about how heavy some of this work is, right? In organizing, coming together, creating these collectivities um, and the tensions that may arise from that. And I also wonder too, if there is, I feel as though the emphasis of joy within these movements, uh, within this type of work tends to get offset or is a conversation that is outside of the movement. Sometimes it gets lost. So I wonder if there is a way to interface um, or envision, like you were all saying, is it possible? And I, and I know that it's possible, right, to, to think about joy as, the pro as part of the process. But I'd like to hear how you all center these moments of joy within, um, you know, things like creativity, revolt, and healing. Thank you, Thelma. That's ex yeah, I appreciate your you're putting it out there. So, so this is what I'd like to do, y'all. We have about 10 minutes left. So I'd love to get a few responses to Thelma's question, especially from folks that did not respond to the first round of questions. And then if it's cool with folks, I thought it might be appropriate, um, given that, you know, Eddie's made his way over here today uh, to close with uh, Navid's question, um, which is uh, drawing from something Sekou Odinga said about U.S. political prisoners. So if y'all can humor me, I'd love to close with that and just hear from you, Eddie, to close us out. Um, as we as we leave in 10 minutes. So on Thelma's question about joy, how joy intersects, interfaces with revolt, with what we do, can y'all talk about this? And, and I'd love to privilege the folks that did not respond to the first question. So um, just unmute and start talking or, or make a gesture toward me. Hi, oh, hey, Dylan. Um, Please. Yeah, I, I was just teaching earlier this morning and we were talking about undocumented youth and 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 the and their families and the way they end up having to sort of just avoid contact with authorities, society, et cetera. And it's really easy to get into describing them as an invisible population um, when they're quite when they're very much a visible one. They're sitting right next to us. They're sitting in this room right now. And so, and so, and part of that is their joy, but part of that is just everything else about their humanity. And so it, and so even when we're doing the work of critiquing the state for raking people over the coals that um, those folks are having a good time too. You know, they're with us. And so, so at least in, in, we were just talking about say in my classroom and, and we were trying to emphasize that just the wholeness of them, you know, they, that, that they're whole that, and, um, and there's a status issue that puts them in danger, but, um, but they're still going to work every day and going to school every day. And so in that essence, in that sense, I think that's, that's a big part of the message. So. And y'all making me think as I as I listen to you and as I read what's going on in chat that that there's a Thelma's point raises an I think I think a really an important um, an important area of, of of kind of collective reflection about how we think about joy. And Dean's point is 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 this very thing is that the way we think about joy is sometimes really um, narrow, really consumerist, really commodified. So like, how do you how do you can how can you experience joy and rage? You know what I mean? How do you experience joy within shared rage, within shared anger? I mean, like there's all this, all these different ways that I know people experience joy that doesn't fit the description. Uh, who, who else can respond to this besides, um, wants to respond to this besides? I'll jump in real quick, Dylan. Thank you. This is Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think to some degree that brings me back home to my first, one of my earlier points about language. So in Quechua, for example, there's a concept of Kame that is exactly what you're saying, Dylan, that you can't have love without rage. One enables the other. So, you know, we were dialectical long before Marx. Um, so, so I would just, you know, and then I think of in terms of like joyous moments now and how we experience that, I think one, you know, at least it, it's, you know, and earlier conversations about, um, about how to kind of build struggle right now and build, build coalition. And it is challenging in these times, you know, I think, especially when, you know, one of the cardinal rules in a sense of people who are in movements is like show up and it's so hard just to show up 
given the context of the pandemic and you know so so there's a lot of challenges right now but um um but i just want to um suggest something that's just given me joy recently and i think for a lot of native peoples is just the new series reservation dogs um but it's also a good example of how like they find joy in these moments of real um connection um in you know that aren't um that aren't um separate from you know the other things in their life it's a it's a real sort of um wholeness of of you know how they ex express and experience joy um and then dylan i don't think we should end this thing without uh giving a shout out to your book white reconstruction as a way <laughs> to continue to think about all this stuff so i'll drop that link in the chat well, everybody should definitely read my absolutely everyone should read my book yes yeah, required <laughs> I'll give you the one paragraph summary if you all don't want to read it. Just hit me up. Um, uh, uh, Je Jennifer, is it okay if I pick on you to, to think about joy with us? Because I know you got a ton of wisdom about this. And then, and then we can close it out with the, um, with it, it, Navid, I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly. I'll ask you if, if you're still here. Yeah, I'll ask you to unmute in a second. And maybe you can raise this question for Eddie and Eddie can, 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 uh, can shut this thing down for us. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jennifer. Thank you. Sure. All right. I mean, I, okay. I personally, in my personal life, uh, really struggle to let myself feel joy um, because I feel like, you know, when we're talking about the importance of being disciplined, it's easy to lose that, but we can't lose it. And I think one thing that, um, you know, we try to do um, within Red Nation is celebrate every victory, no matter how small, um, because I feel like a lot of times, um, you know, on the left, we get overrun with demoralization, right? Like, um, and, you know, talking about how like, oh, that's, you know, what did that do? What did that ultimately do? Or, you know, what really changed? And like, we know that change is incremental sometimes. And obviously we're critical of when people act like, uh, you know, like like Dean was talking about earlier, like, um, you know, small reforms are an end all be all and we're done and we don't have anything else to do. And, you know, obviously we know that, um, you know, reform is not the way to go, but it's worth celebrating the small victories that mean a lot to our people, even something like Indigenous Peoples Day, which we know, you know, a lot of time only exists in the realm of representation, but, um, you know, it is empowering for Native people, or even like the election of Deb Holland, which, you know, I was personally very conflicted about. I'm not super happy with her leadership thus far, but what does it, what use does it do to like, you know, publicly shit on her when so many Pueblo women are like beyond you know, joyed and, uh, you know, empowered by, you know, her coming to power. And so I think we just try to look at, you know, what is ultimately going to get people motivated? What is going to help the masses fight demoralization? Or, or, you know, like Sandy's Reservation Dogs example, do I have critiques of the show and the producers? Of course I do, but it, it, it brings hope to Native people. It reminds them, um, you know, that there's, there's always a time to to be joyful and um but i think even more into that outside of like you know the realm of representation i think it's worth celebrating everyday victories right if we can de-arrest someone at an action if we can um you know get someone a hot meal if we can help someone find shelter like these are what you know make it all matter even like you know when we were supporting the family of l'oreal sinagini after she was murdered by austin shipley that family said they didn't think anybody would care um, to reach out for them, that nobody would care for L'Oreal. And like, it, it means a lot just to simply be in solidarity with people. And it's it's always worth celebrating kinship and connections that are made, um, even if you know those connections are made through something traumatic and through struggle or something terrible brings us together. It, and um, yeah, it's 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 not um, it's not always worth it to have a heavy handed critique if it comes at the cost of, um, you know, empowering people. Thank, thank you for that, Jennifer. That's yeah, that's a really nuanced response. I appreciate it. And, and um, uh, Navid, could do you, do you mind unmuting and maybe asking your question live? Um, and, and Eddie, you can respond to it. Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Am I pronouncing your name properly? It's Navid. 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 Okay, I did it right the first time. Thank you, Navid. Yeah, Don't raise a question. And, and Eddie, close this yeah. out if you don't mind after Navid asks it. Yeah, so this is uh, directed mainly toward Mr. Conway. Uh, thank you for being uh, with the panel. Um, so I attended a talk a few years ago by uh, Se uh, Seiko Odenga, and he said that 
uh, one of the first demands in any liberation struggle by those who are struggling is the freeing of political prisoners. Um, but that's, that hasn't been the case in the United States. And so my question is, um, you know, why do you think that's, that's the reality in the United States? Um, do you all see this as a shortcoming of the left in the US? Uh, is it a failure in organizing? Or is it something else that, that can explain that? So again, thank you. Okay, I, I guess the first thing I would have to say is that in most cases, uh, uh, political prisoners uh, arise out of a well-organized grassroots kind of activity from political parties uh, that at some point are forced into uh, self-defense or even uh, armed propaganda. Uh, in, in the United States, what happened was uh, the Black Liberation Army, per se, and elements of the Black Panther Party and elements of other different groups uh, were goaded uh, into uh, armed self-defense and armed guerrilla activity prematurely. The, the population was not organized on the ground, on the grassroots level uh, to sustain that kind of activity. Uh, an insidious program was created by the government uh, World War II, uh, COINTELPRO, counterintelligence uh, program that uh, was very divisive. It broke up the grassroots organizing across the country. Uh, it used the police, it used the government agencies, it used the mafia, it used uh, gangsters, uh, and it disrupted the ability to organize. It targeted with a program called Weed and Seed, the primary leaders of those struggles. Uh, it rewarded the people that work with the government and uh, put them up as leaders. It created uh, neoliberal leaders for the black community. It used the church, it used other uh, agencies, the newspaper, et cetera. And then they did something right at the end of all that to the community. They drugged the community and they used those drugs to continue to disrupt any kind of organizing. So uh, the communities of color went through a, a whole series from like the, through the seventies to the eighties from drug, from drugs to AIDS. Uh, and I'm not saying AIDS is a government uh, project or program, but the communities were devastated. A lot of activists was lost. People that weren't, weren't assassinated and that weren't ran out of the country were locked up. Uh, on the other hand, the people that work with the government end up getting lucrative jobs. Similar to what we see right now, unfortunately, with Black Lives Matter, uh, it's a lot of Black Lives Matter activists, not grassroots activists, but so-called spokespeople or whatever, uh, gaining lucrative positions. They are getting money. They are, they are, they're being bombarded uh, with uh, grants and fellowships and so on. And they're the spokesperson. The ones that are down on the ground rebelling, they are being charged with terrorism in LA or in other places or being ignored or, or labeled or targeted. Uh, so you have several government programs. One, you have one, that whole activity that we engaged in were premature. That's one thing. Hey, thanks to Eddie for the closing thoughts. That brings us to an end. I hope that folks will pick up on this discussion. And as we've been saying in these last few minutes that we proliferate this set of um, provocations, this collective study, this work um, through whatever spaces, through whatever communities and collectives that we can participate in. Um, thank you. I, I'm deeply grateful to Jennifer, Rachel, Dean, Sandy, David, Eddie, Dorothy. Um, thank you all. And uh, I hope you all 
enjoy this. Hope the folks that are that are taking all this in will find that it serves their their skill sets, that expands their toolkits, weaponize this, move forward. Thank you all.